Well, when uh, I think I talked a little bit earlier about how this event was born, and uh, uh, it, it came from my experiences uh, in my previous life as editor in chief of Power Engineering and chairman, uh, chairman of Powergen International, uh, I approached uh, approached Sean Trotsky and later Dave Hager about uh, doing this uh, event uh, event for us, and and they were all in. Uh, they didn't make me beg or plead. Uh, they were all in right away. So we're very grateful uh, to Sean Trotsky, Dave Hager, and of course Mike Ming uh, for volunteering uh, to take part in this event uh, today. Uh, with that, let's introduce uh, our next keynote speaker. Dave Hager is president of Devitt Energy Corporation, one of the nation's largest independent oil and natural gas producers. He joined the company as executive vice president of exploration and production. He later served as Chief Operating Officer before being elected by the board to his current position in 2015. Uh, the list goes on and on, but instead of embarrassing uh, Mr. Hager like I did uh, Sean earlier this morning, I'll just say that uh, he is an outstanding individual. In addition to being a leader of industry, he is a leader in nonprofits and a leader in giving back to the community and developing both the city and this great state. With that, please help me welcome Dave Hager to the stage. Thank you, Dave. Well, thank you, Russell. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning, and uh, welcome to VAST, and welcome to the Devon Tower, and I hope you are enjoying your morning uh, very much here. Uh, I thought what I would do today, you know, you're getting a CEO talk here, so, oh God, that's scary. Keep going past that, there we go. Uh, um, you're gonna get a, a CEO level talk here with a little bit of technology mixed in. And we, we, we kind of went back and forth on this presentation, frankly. Uh, Tony Thornton, who's sitting right here, helped develop the presentation. We, at one point, had a lot more technical content in here, and. Frankly, that always makes me nervous because even though I come from a technical background uh, historically, uh, I admit my technical skills are rusty and out of date compared to many in our company. And so when I start talking about some of the latest technological developments that we have going on in the company, I get nervous. The people that are really doing the technology start to cringe a little bit. And, uh, and so I said, okay, we're gonna do this a little bit different. We're gonna talk about how technology has impacted our business, why it's important for the business, uh, and then I'll try to give you a little bit of hint on a couple of ways that we're using technology, but we're not gonna go too deep into that, I wouldn't say today, but uh, if, you, if you hear something that kind of tweaks your interest, I can certainly put people in touch uh, with you that would uh, be more uh, better at describing some of the technical details around some of the things that we're doing that, than I am myself. So with that, let's go ahead and, and get going here a little bit. And I thought what I'd do is start off with just a little bit of description of Devon. And you know, I think if, if you're not here intimately involved in the company, you just see the building every day and you say, oh, ever, well, that building looks the same every day. It looks the same yesterday as it does today. And, it looks, and so probably everything's uh, pretty static and, and not much is changing. Where the reality is, Devon has changed dramatically over the 10 years that I've been with the company. We've have had to adjust, obviously, with the commodity price environment uh, and the challenges associated with that, and we have adjusted. And, and the good news to come out of all of this is that we are a company that's a strong company with strong growth prospects, uh, outstanding employees, and we're very, uh, very low debt levels and we're confident we're gonna be an important part of the oil and gas business for a long time and an important part of Oklahoma City for a long, long time. But when you look at it from a map standpoint, uh, the black dots here indicate where we had uh, probably about 10 years or so ago uh, assets all over the globe and the red area indicates where we've really focused and we have focused now back to being a U.S. onshore producer. Uh, we have four key areas that we are focused on. The first one I would highlight would be out in, we call it the Delaware, it's not in the state of Delaware obviously, it's the Delaware Basin, which is 
uh, the, the western half of the Permian Basin, uh, the eastern half is in Texas, the Delaware Basin is actually in southeast New Mexico. We also have assets down in Eagleford in south, uh, south Texas, the stack assets just immediately northwest of us here in town and then up in the Powder River Basin. Uh, we also still have our interest in the Barnett, uh, which is where we actually kicked off the whole horizontal drilling hydraulic fracturing revolution. Devon was the first company to do that and, and kick that off. We still have that asset. We've actually had it up for sale here the past few months. We're uh, working through that sales process as we speak. But I think this is, it starts to get into something that's a little bit more interesting. Uh, but see, but it, it gives you an idea for what's taking place, if I can describe the graphs a little bit. The, the bubble chart on the left side there, that is a a chart of wells in our what we call the Delaware Basin which is the key area where we have activity and the x-axis there uh, indicates the productivity from the wells and then the y-axis is the rate of change of productivity of those wells. In other words how much have we improved the productivity uh, year over year and you and then the size of the bubbles indicates how many uh, how many wells we've really di drilled, how active are we out there, and you have essentially all the other competitors that are active in the Delaware Basin showing up there also, and so you can see not only are we drilling the most productive wells in the basin, but the rate of change uh, also is important for everyone to understand just how much more productive these wells are. And then on the right side, the chart is really more of a cost side, and uh, you can see there that, and it's hard to read, but in one year we've had a 65 improvement, uh, percent improvement in completion efficiency and a 45 percent improvement in drilling costs in one year. Now that's in a particular formation called the Wolf Camp Formation, which is probably our most dramatic example that we're having. But how are we doing all this? It's technology. Technology is the key thing that's driving everything that we're doing in these businesses and is having a tangible impact on the results that we have. And, and that's really part of the overall story of this industry is that we, when, when shale came around and the unconventional business came around in this industry, it was disruptive. It was good, but it was disruptive. And so we had to uh, move from the deep water environment uh, out to where we're drilling wells onshore. We had to figure out what are the best areas to drill the wells, what are the best zones in each of those areas, what spacing should we drill all these wells. And we went through a period of an indus uh, industry for where we drilled some good wells, we produced a lot, but we didn't make a lot of money is what it boils down to. The economics were not that good. But what's happened here recently is with the use of technology and efficiency, we're now in a much healthier position where we are producing the best results we ever have and very economic results and are allow us to uh, grow the company from a healthy standpoint. And this kind of gets at it a little bit more. And these, we built into our uh, 2019, 20, or 2019 budget a $200 million improvement over 2018 and how efficiently we would drill the wells. That was built into our budget. What the slide on the left side says, if you look at 2019 and 2020, not only are we getting that $200 million improvement, we're getting another $400 million in improvement beyond that $200 million improvement that we had budgeted. And we're doing this, as the, uh, the right side of the slide shows here, we're delivering the same amount of oil and gas production. So this isn't because we're cutting back on activity or anything else. We're doing the same activity, but we're doing it for $600 million cheaper on a total of about $4 billion. So the math of that, what, who's good at math? 15% or so in one year improvement and that is largely being driven by how efficiently we're able to drill these wells because of the use of technology. And this is another slide that really is more specific to Devon, but this, on the left side of the slide in this uh, bar chart here, 
This is a set of all the well, wells that are being drilled in the onshore U.S. by all producers. So this isn't some highlight slide that says we did our one really good 10,000 barrel a day well and I want to tell you all about it or something like that. This is all the wells being drilled by all the U.S. producers and the y-axis here is what we call the 90-day IP, which means how much oil and gas did you produce in the first 90 days out of the well, which is the best indicator we have really of how productive wells are going to be. And this is for all the companies. And you can see where, where Devon stacks up, right at the, the very top. So we are drilling some of the most productive wells by any company in the onshore United States. And then you say, okay, that's great. How long are you going to be able to do that? Well, what we're showing here on the right side here is we have a 15-year inventory, at least right now, of these type wells we can drill. So we're not just doing it now, but we're going to be here for a long time doing this. And this is why when I show these cost reductions coupled with uh, the productivity that we're able to do and the inventory that we have, that's where I have a lot of confidence in the future. And the last thing I'll say on the Devon commercial side of it here, but I thought you guys would appreciate this, is uh, our debt levels. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of information here, though. On the upper left here is a chart of when uh, the maturity on our debt is. If you see, we don't have any maturity of any debt until 2025. And our overall debt levels are very low. We have if you, one ratio that's commonly used in the industry is uh, net debt to cash flow and, uh, or net debt to EBITDAx is described here. And ours is one. And say, okay, what does that mean? That sounds very financial. My simple way of thinking about that is everybody can sit here and calculate it in your personal life is how much debt do you have compared to how much cash you bring in every year? So if you add up your mortgages and credit cards and auto loans and all this stuff, how much does that compare to the cash flow you bring in every year, that ratio? So everybody figuring out their own number, okay? And ours is one as a company. So we have our debt is equal to our annual cash flow. So that's considered extremely healthy. And we have driven down the debt levels just since I've become CEO from over $10 billion to around $2.6 billion overall, which is a, a significant reduction and again, and that's why we have a lot of confidence in the future here for a long, long time. So I'll get off the Devon commercial here, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a, I thought you'd appreciate that, but I guess this is going probably a little bit more personal here, I would say, but this is give you a little perspective on, uh, I feel in ways I've been blessed. I've been in this industry for 40 years, first as a technical professional, a working geophysicist, and I feel like I've been fortunate. I've been around what I think are some really unique things and, and, and the theme that I'm trying to portray here is this has been a technology uh, industry for a long time and it continues to be a technology industry. I, I was fortunate back when I was a working level geophysicist to actually be involved in uh, getting to design and interpret some of the first 3D seismic programs that were ever, uh, ever worked and so 3D really kind of revolutionized the ability to image the sub subsurface, and now it's become standard. Uh, uh, almost all the plays you have a 3D. Back when I first started, it would, you know, we weren't even doing it on computers. We're doing paper records and all this stuff, and learned how to fold my sections and line up the correlations and all this weird stuff, which makes no sense to you guys. But uh, then we got involved in 3D, and it really has for conventional exploration and unconventional exploration has helped reduce the risk of finding hydrocarbons significantly. Later on, I was fortunate I got to be involved in some a lot of deep water work. And um, the deep water really at this, the, the onshore is pretty dead, uh, frankly, at this time. So the future of the industry was perceived to be uh, offshore and, and uh, deep water where you really can't have uh, uh, facilities are fixed to the bottom of the ocean. They're, they're too deep for that, so you have floating facilities everywhere. And now uh, you have production in out to as much as 10,000 foot water depth. And I was fortunate I got to be involved in some of the first in the world type of uh, 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 things that were going on out in the deep water back in uh, mid to late 90s or so, uh, in early, er, carrying on into the early 2000s. But then another revolution came along. 
And I wasn't, frankly wasn't at Devon when this revolution started, but Devon was the one company that kicked off this whole unconventional revolution. It was the first company in the Barnett Shale to drill a well that had been horizontally drilled, uh, a horizontal well, and hydraulically fractured. You'd done both of those separately. There had been wells, vertical wells have been hydraulically fractured. There have been horizontal wells that have been drilled that hadn't been fracked, but nobody had combined those two technology. And Devon was the first company to combine it, first into Barnett and gas type formations. Then later the industry obviously has gotten extremely active in doing it uh, in the oil plays as well, and that's really the focus of where we are today. And what has it done, and what has it all this done? Again, I'm, uh, uh, what's, the, what, what's the benefit to you or as a consumer, not just as to what's the benefit to the industry, but what's the benefit to the normal consumer out there? And, you know, if you're like me, I get a little bit tired of getting beat up about what, because uh, I, I think this industry has done so much good for this country and continue to do so much good for this country uh, that uh, I'm tired of hearing about all this other stuff. Uh, and yeah, we have issues like everybody else, but this is the most fundamental thing that we've done. And so oil is shown in uh, kind of the dark blue color or black and natural gas is shown in the kind of gold colored there. And this is a chart to get annual chart. So if you go back, this is around 2008, 2009, and then out in the future. And so what you've seen with the advent really of horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracture, how it has stabilized prices, and particularly past 2015, stabilized prices and stabilized prices at a much lower level. And we tend to forget about that as consumers and what this has done for the, for the good of the country uh, to bring back manufacturing into the, uh, this country for what it's done for national defense. Uh, we are now the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. We're a net exporter of natural gas. We're a net exporter of oil. Uh, uh, the benefits to this uh, are just so stunning. We had uh, obviously a couple months ago a drone attack in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I would say if that had happened 20 years ago, price of oil would have spiked the 80, 90, 100 dollars a barrel. What happened? We had like a one weekend reaction of a few dollars a barrel and then nothing. And why is that? It's because of what this industry has done here in the United States with the unconventional revolution and uh, the ability to produce oil and gas here in the United States to lessen the dependency on, on foreign oil. Now prices have also, it's been good uh, in some way for the consumer, frankly, we're a victim of our own success and a victim in a way of our lack of discipline. And we've had, with low interest rates, we've had a lot of money come into the industry. And we frankly, we are producing so much oil and gas from this um, uh, unconventional revolution that has actually caused prices to come down. But of course, when prices come down, what happens? We well, have to get innovative and you have to do a better job. And that's what some of the slides that I indicated earlier, that this has caused our company and I think the entire industry to come up with ways to be successful at lower price points. Uh, if OPEC felt when they, uh, in late 2015, when they tried to uh, uh, maintain market share, increase production, that they had a feeling they might be able to drive this unconventional industry at least into fi dire financial straits. And certainly it's been a challenge, but I'd say also we have innovated. It's not put any of us out of, has not put us out of business, hadn't put most companies out of business. And now we are, because of the innovation, and because of the use of technology, we're now in a position that we can profitably produce oil and gas at much lower prices than probably we even imagine. So, okay, say, so, well, what is some of this technology? So here we go, I'm getting dangerous now. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of here um, that are portrayed on this. Uh, these, this has two different pictures that are really meant to uh, portray two different things. One is what we call our Wellcon, and it's actually located on the 34th floor of this building. And this is a centralized well control room that we have 
from which we monitor operations of all wells that we drill throughout the United States. Now the truth is we built this facility a few years ago and we did extensive centralized monitoring of wells from this location a few years ago. Now because of the continued advancements of technology, we don't use it as much as we used to, but we still do use it because a lot of things that now could be done centralized are now available on your iPhones or iPads and you can sit at home and do a lot of the functions that uh, we did in a centralized facility a few years ago. But we still do geosteer all of our wells through this facility. And so geosteer is where you have to guide the well to stay within the appropriate geological formation in a horizontal well and we still do all of that work out of this facility on the 34th floor. The bottom picture is, is uh, what we call DSCs, everybody loves their acronyms, they're, but they're uh, or decision support centers. And so these are, for, these are places in all of our field offices where via SCADA, via remote monitoring, we get a tremendous amount of information on each of our facilities in the field. And so we have totally changed really how our field operates in the past few years. Rather than have our operators drive, uh, drive in a pickup truck uh, blindly essentially from one facility to another not knowing if there's any issue or not, now every morning and they pull out this thing and the way I think about it is they have a screen of the key parameters that are informed by this decision support center of of all their facilities, all their wells, and my simple mind says it either says red on the screen or green on the screen. And, and if it's green, everything's okay. If something's red, then you know there's a problem with that particular facility. We tie that into our GIS mapping. We have specialists for each type of problem that may come up there. Our GIS mapping tells us where all our trucks are in the field. We know the capabilities of the people in those trucks and we know who to send to that facility as quickly as we can to fix that particular problem. Bottom line, we have more uptime on our wells. Rather than driving blindly from well to well, not, or facility to facility to know whether we have a problem or not, it leads to increased uptime. We send the right person to the right facility in a much quicker time frame, and, and, we, and we get better results that way. This is an example of geosteering, uh, where we're, uh, and it shows back in 2013 on top and 2017, I think it is, a well on the bottom. But the key thing is, with our geosteering that we do, where we're actually steering where the well is in, uh, going, and, and you think about it, it's, if this isn't technology, I don't know what it is. I mean, you get these high-tech companies get excited because they're going to send somebody through McDonald's and can understand what words they, they say in the, in the drive through Okay, whoo, that's really exciting, isn't it? Okay, compare that to drilling a well seven to 8,000 feet in the subsurface, then going 10,000 feet laterally and keeping it within a 10-foot vertical interval 90-plus percent of the time. Okay, that's a little better than that technology stuff those, I, those companies out in California like to talk about in my mind. So, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little carried away there. But, uh, uh, but this is, and, and the ability to geosteer has dramatically improved over the past few years um, as evidenced the 2013 versus the 2017 results. Uh, we actually are doing some, what we call cyber steering, uh, where we actually have built uh, computer algorithms that are uh, anticipating things uh, that are going on down hole and so they know what may happen and are actually starting to steer the welds without uh, actually someone sitting in the 34th floor and telling the, the rig, okay, how to, uh, when to slide when, and when to actually rotate and when, where to guide the well. We tend to do it right now in our more simple wells, while the humans tend to concentrate on the uh, more challenging wells, but this is an advancement that's taking place we think is going to be even bigger in the future. Another thing we're doing is uh, what we're calling our Field of the Future project, and we're, we're piloting this up in the Powder River Basin of Wyoming, uh, and we're doing that for a reason, because the uh, uh, the weather can be a little bit tougher up there, and th these are very remote locations. 
And so driving from fa uh, facility to facility is, is problematic, uh, even, if, uh, even if we have some of the SCADA equipment I described before. So we're using cameras a lot more up there. We're actually using infrared cameras in some case to monitor tank levels. Uh, rather than having the old gauges that you just put a stick in or whatever to monitor it. Uh, we're actually doing that in some cases through infrared cameras. The cameras allow us also to detect leaks quicker if we have very minor leaks associated with it. Uh, having, and again, it's all tied into our mapping system and everything. Great success. I think last weekend, snowstorm up there. Uh, they were telling me they had up to five foot snow drifts up in the uh, Powder River Basin, and so you have cameras combined with our SCADA, and you can see why we have much better uptime on our wells than we had uh, in the past. This is a very simple sports analogy here, talking about predictive analytics. I think everybody knows what predictive analytics is all about. It's, it's using data to predict what may happen, and you know this is the the guys up up to bat there, and you've used historical data to figure out what percent of the time he hits the, the ball, which direction, and so all the players on the infield and the outfield then know where to position to have the most likely uh, ability to, to, to get, not let him get a hit, but get an out out of it. So that's exactly what we're doing in a lot of aspects of our business now. We're starting to use it in some degree to uh, protect uh, uh, ESP failures, electrical submersible pump failures. Other equipment on rigs, we're predicting more when we may have problems uh, associated with that. So rather than sit there and wait for something to happen and something to fail, we're actually using data in many cases to predict when something may fail so that we can uh, take uh, preventive maintenance on things uh, beforehand. We're also using this type of thing to do a lot of the more rudimentary work involved in our technical uh, professionals day. Uh, there's a lot of work that is really more, I'd say, mechanical in nature. Uh, in other words, there's not a lot of high tech involved interpretation, but just gathering of data, sifting through data, making sure data is good. We have uh, built internal algorithms to do that so that they can concentrate a lot of their day on the really the more high end level information that can that is truly value adding. I'm not getting too specific on this. There's a, if you want to talk, we have a tool called Sifter. It does a sift through a lot of data. There's other people in the room or in our company who can describe that a lot better than I can. But it's, a, it's really important to a lot of our uh, uh, people working subsurface data to allow them to, to do a better job. Last thing I want to mention here is what we call ESG, and that's uh, env it stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And despite my kind of smart aleck comments here about uh, uh, California and, and whatever, uh, we recognize that our industry, even though it's valuable, we have to hold ourselves to a high standard when it comes to uh, how we operate uh, and and uh, and to be responsible and to do so in the most environmentally friendly way. And we take it quite seriously at Devon. Uh, we have a number of initiatives going on uh, in order to really focus and make sure that we are operating in a way that is appropriate and is appreciated by the industry in general. I show on the right side here some of the uh, various rating agencies uh, there are for how we fall out on our ESG performance. And the bottom line is we are well above average on all of them. We actually just got one in a couple weeks ago from, I'm not sure where I see it here, it's a company called Just Capital. I may be shown here right at the bottom. Out of 32 companies in our industry, uh, we came in third out of 32 in our industry. And what's more importantly, I think, is you know people tend to think of us as a, an industry that doesn't perform so well in the metrics. According to Just Capital, we came in the top 20% of all companies, all industries in our environmental performance. So we're proud of that. We have voluntary emissions reduction targets, uh, methane emission reduction intensity targets that are tied to my compensation. How much I get paid is, is tied into the uh, environmental targets uh, as well as the other executives. Uh, and we think it's fundamentally important for our industry and for our company to take this extremely seriously, this whole area, and we're doing it. So I hope you can see and get an idea through all this 
we're, we're, we're a company, and I think our industry, we're problem solvers. I mean, that's the way we come to work every day. We don't come to work and uh, uh, just say, you know, we don't sell things so much. It's more of a commodity. That's not the way we think so much. We come to work, we see issues, and every day, our staff uh, here in the, uh, both in this building and in the field, we're solving problems. And that's the way we're oriented. And I think that's what our whole industry has been about. It's about now, and it's been about that for a long, long time. And I'll close here with a quote that I often like to, to do, uh, and I'll, I'll read it to you in case you can't see it. It says, we usually find oil in new places with old ideas. Sometimes we find oil in an old place with a brand new idea, but we seldom find much oil in an old place with an old idea. Several times in the past we've thought that we were running out of oil when actually we were running out of ideas. And that was written by a University of Technology, uh, University of Tulsa geology professor, Park Dickey, in 1958. So think about that. And so that's what we've done since 1958 and, and long before that. We, we are an industry that has innovated, whether it's in the uh, 3D that I described or the deep water and now the horizontal drilling and the hydraulic fracturing. And now we have a new challenge, is to make sure that we are doing so in the most environmentally responsible manner. And I have no doubt that this industry is gonna meet that challenge uh, now and in the future, and we're gonna be a big part of this uh, world economy for many, many years to come. So thanks a lot, uh, appreciate your time today. <clears throat>